All right, so I've chosen today's video on basically spiritual warfare and what we can expect in kind of everyday life. And while there's so many angles and so many approaches that you can come at spiritual warfare, I can only do like one approach or one angle, you know, per study kind of a thing. And so I'll, I, I saw that as I was looking at so many verses on spiritual warfare and asking the Holy Spirit, what angle do I come at this? You know, like, for, for example, as, as if I were to call it part one, um, that, you know, like what, what approach do you want me to take with this? And immediately I was told, go to the divided house um, with Luke's approach. And so I want to explain that real quick. The reason I went, you know, as you guys know, when Jesus is talking and telling us parables or telling us anything, there's, there's three accounts. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, John, not so much, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are recording pretty much the exact th same things. The difference being Matthew records things verbatim because he, he, he had shorthand. So he, he records precisely what Jesus' words are. Mark uh, will record the actions of Jesus. And Luke, his account, he records the feelings of Jesus. And John, on the other hand, completely different. He is talking mostly about who Jesus is as the Savior and as a, uh, you know, man and, you know, God in flesh. And so, so John's always completely different. And so I took Luke's approach on his parable about the divided house because it's how Jesus feels about that. And that's kind of where we are. You know, we don't, um, well, at the end, I'm going to give us scriptures for prayers about the divided house. Before I start getting into that parable on what he's teaching us and why he's teaching us us this, this uh, about the divided house is, you know, it's because of the division between what the Pharisees and the lawyers and the Sadducees, basically the lawyers are like the scribes. Anyway, so what's being happening here is that they're trying to divide Jesus away from their religiosity or away from their temple or away from their law, away from their teachings. And so when I think about spiritual warfare, that's really what's happening is that the purpose of the demons, of the fallen angels and Satan's overall number one agenda from day one, from Genesis 3.15 in, in the garden with Eve, um, is always about dividing the house. And he does that by today, the, the, the subtle ways that he does it is simply, for, for example, it could be the music that's being played in the house or the TV show or the, or the movie or the conversation, or like you probably encounter Lexi, the lovey-dovey fluffy Jesus saying, well, let's all, let's manifest, you know, our good intentions. Let's raise our vibration and be all about love and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, with good intention, I'm going to cover that in the scripture where it talks about literally that in the scripture. And so, so I'm coming at this spiritual warfare from a point of, of how Jesus dealt with it and break that down in Luke, uh, really simply from uh, Luke, uh, Luke 11, 14 to 23 is what I'll be concentrating on today. And before I start Luke uh, 14, 23 and what he's dealing with, I just wanted to put out there kind of as a, um, you know, we're all, we are told we are going to have, uh, warfare on us I call it tribulation, uh, call it oppression or affliction while, so I just, I just want to kind of start out by saying, while those of us with the Holy Spirit in us, those of us who are saved and who are believers, we cannot be demon possessed. So I just wanted to make that super clear with that being said, it doesn't mean the demons aren't hanging over us, around us, and in our house, constantly trying, constantly, not trying to, but will be able to afflict and oppress us. And so they can do that. They cannot enter us unless we invite them. But there can be people in our house that have invited demonic presence 
And even though it doesn't seem evil, it's very subtle, it's still there. It still divides the house. And so I just wanted to look, I, I come at this from the approach of, for example, me here in Sedona, I only have like two actual humans that I talk to. And that's rare when I do, but when I do, I only have two. They're both Laodicean. So in other words, when I'm with them, no matter where I'm at, with them at their house or, or, or at a restaurant, you know, wherever I'm at, that, that would be considered a divided house. I know that going into that, I am putting myself in a situation where there's going to be a demonic affliction or oppression. Now, I know how to pray over that, and I know how it not to affect me. But not, nonetheless, those of us who have busy lives, like young mothers and grandmothers of young children, uh, you don't have the, the uh, I guess I would say, the, the, the nicety of being able to be in that constant, you're distracted, you're busy, you're living life, but you're in a house that's divided because all of us will find ourselves pretty much never not being in a house that's divided. When you come down to understanding, uh, most people could care less about God or the living word, about reading the Bible. They just don't care. That they can throw around, I believe in God, and can they, you, they can throw around the name Jesus every now and then, but it doesn't mean they're, they're not Laodicean. And so we just have to keep in mind, a Laodicean is, in some regards, way worse than someone who is outright, uh, you know, saying they're practice, practicing Satanism. So that's why I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with these verses. I'm going to start with three verses, and we're going to get into Luke. So the first verse I want to read is 1 Peter 3, 12 to 14. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So I chose that out of all that I could have looked at, or I should say all that I did look at. And it's like, it tells us right there, you know, even though we're going to maintain our, our zealous for Jesus and the word, um, even though we maintain our righteousness, we will be blessed, but not in the here and now, not in the every day. But, but we're being told, don't have fear of them. Don't be troubled. In other words, um, you're going to be a witness. It's going to be around you, but don't let it, I guess I want to say weasel its way in. It's probably the best way I can say that. And so, so we may suffer, uh, you know, by staying true to God. But again, we're just told not to fear. Um, another verse I picked out was Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I chose that because even though we try to tell our friends, our family, our loved ones, what have you, um, they're going to hear that truth. And as you witness them, maybe not following or resorting back to their own comfortable lifestyle, um, you just you got to realize that um, that is an invitation. And, and again, I only say it because it does create a house divided so that you know when you're at least in one prayer a day, you pray against that divided house. And I have seven scriptures that I, at the end of this study, I will give out that are good prayers for that divided house because honestly, 99% of the people living on planet Earth today are living in a divided house. That includes 99% of all churches, temples, synagogues, you name it, it's divided. It wasn't Jesus's day. With the actual people who, who knew the 300 prophecies minimum, and I did a study on that before I did this study. I did a study on what is the minimum? What, how many prophecies did those religiosity people, Pharisees, Sadducees, the lawyers, and so forth, basically the Jews, how many prophecies did they read about the first coming they simply ignored? That's over 300. I'll point some of them out in this, you know, I wanted, I wanted to try and stay uh, on track with the divided house. The last one I chose uh, before we get started in Luke is John 15, 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, 
they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. I chose that because so many people try to discount or to, for example, I watched somebody, one of my Laodicean friends sent me a video and it was so, I, I, wrote, a vi I wrote an entire video on a two minute TikTok thing that was sent to me. Um, I had over almost over 3,500 words to say about this uh, blasphemy. The video is called Blaspheming Christ. But when I saw what these, not only Laodicean, but the fluffy feel good, let's manifest a new reality, let's manifest the world we want to live in. One of my, both of my Laodicean friends are big on that. Let's manifest the world we want to live in. Let's raise our vibration, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so I'm going to point out scriptures <laughs> that talk against that, but that's the reason I chose that one. Oh, so, so what's happening here is in Luke, Jesus in his day, right? Jesus has left Jerusalem and he's gone down to Galilee. And Jesus is dealing with this very issue. And, and I, I, I use this because we are dealing with it. And yet the demons now have 2,000 years of practice and knowledge and, you know, watching us and, and, and knowing our generational sins of the father or generational curses because they follow the dna lines so jesus is dealing with this big time it's it's throughout all of the you know middle east everywhere he walked and he is dealing with this we've got it we've got two thousand years more practice against us you know more generational we've you know we they've got two thousand years on us that we we don't have because demons are immortal you know they're never going to die and so they've got all of this on us. And that's the reason I, I bring this up. And so, um, so what the demons have, uh, I wanted to point out here, is that, uh, once again, like I already said, when we have the Holy Spirit in us, they cannot possess us, uh, and they, but they can oppress and afflict. However, there's going to come a time, and, and you and I may be alive for this, but there's going to come a time where they're going to be completely and totally let loose the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, which is the, uh, the um, you know, the, uh, it's, it's keeping them back, keeping them at bay. You know, they can only do so much right now, but at one point, that's not the case. By the time Revelation 9-4 gets here, the, the, you know, the Comforter is gone and it's, it's, they're let loose. However, the good news is, for us, we can read in Revelation 9, 4, it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So that's us. We are saved. We have the seal of God in our foreheads. The demons can see that. We have it right now. You know, all three of us have that right now. The demons know that and can see it. Can they hover? Can they try their best to, uh, you know, mock us in our own household? Can they, can they oppress our household? They can do those kinds of things, but we have to kind of rise above that and remember no matter what, um, that we have such superior power over them that it only takes us using one, you know, to remember once or twice a day, one word, get out, you know, just done, be gone, done. Now, we're going to have to do that on a daily basis, but that's okay. If we just remember that once a day, get out. That's all Jesus did. He, no theatrics, no, Jesus never fasted and prayed. I mean, he did pray, but do you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's not like there's not this theatrical things that in the days, the reason that these people are mocking Jesus is because the religious people were casting out demons and they were and it was like a week long theatrical event and they were so uh they were mocking him and saying that there's no way that they're doing that with God and and you know in other words Jesus isn't doing that with God as his power because it requires again the word you know bread and circus it requires for them those those Pharisees, it was a week long event, and you know you know what I'm saying. The Catholics do the same stupid thing today, but it's it's a long drawn out affair. Jesus says one word and it's done, it's gone, and that's and it's over. 
So, um, so the, the, what I want to point out here is what we always need to keep in mind, just like, you know, when John saw the locust demons um, let out of the pit, they will harm the unbelievers. But us, the three of us who have the seal of God on our forehead is always going to be protected. So I just want to always redirect, you know, us back to Psalm 91. And so when in doubt, just always go to Psalm 91, you know, and, and just simply in verses 1 to 3, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. And that's really what it is, fowlers. That's what they call the, most of the women in the Bible are called fowlers. And fowlers means a bait layer. They lay the bait. And that's what we're going to have constantly you know, in our house, whatever we want to call our house, in our little circle of influence or friends or what have you, you're going to have those that keep laying the bait. I, I have that. My Laodicean friends who think they're doing good are constantly laying bait by sending me ridiculous videos that in their own way, uh, not being a lover of Jesus, will go against the Bible and discount everything the Bible says and everything Jesus stands for. And they do it in what they think is a loving way. I'm just putting it out there because you guys, I'm sure, have run into it or will run into it. I do on a weekly basis. So um, so, so I say this because a believer is going to experience illness, injury, uh, or even death, right? So it is told to us that when adversity happens, including death, that it works for the believer's good. This is something we don't want to think about. However, it's just, it's simply there in the word. Um, and it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. Even Paul in prison said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, Paul is saying, I can live with all of my affliction and oppressions, and I can be in prison, I can be starving and beaten and stoned as he was. And he is saying, but I'm going to gain life. I'm going to die, and I'm going to gain eternal life. That's Philippians 1, 21, if you want to take notes. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to Luke 11. I don't want to take up a lot of time today, because I want us, at the end, I'll stop recording, and I want us to be able to talk, because it's such a personal thing. I don't want to record the personal because all of us have uh, our house divided in personal ways. And so I'm not, that's not for the world to hear. I'm not going to put that on recording. So anyway, I want to, I want to jump down to uh, Luke. And again, I'm in Luke 11. So while there's Matthew's version and there's Mark version, uh, just so you know, in Matthew, because uh, Luke, before it gets to this point, Jesus is asking how should the God, the disciples are asking Jesus how do we pray? So just as in Matthew um, six with the Lord's prayer, it's also recorded in Luke eleven. But I'm going to skip over that. We all know the Lord's prayer, and I'm going to start with Luke eleven fourteen. And so it says here, and again after each verse, at least a lot of the verses, I'm just, I'm just going to read fourteen to twenty three. Um, but after each of the verses, I'm going to try and stop and just flush out why Jesus is saying what he's saying, what he's trying to teach us about this, because it's something I think that's hard to understand um, for the average reader. I mean, unless you understand by going through the Jewish library and, and dealing with the culture at that time and realizing Jesus is choosing the words he's choosing and the actions he's doing due to their culture. So Luke eleven fourteen 14, it says, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. It means it could not speak. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. So what's happening here? Jesus is ministering to a mixed crowd of Pharisees and also Gentiles. So you have to remember, there's always... The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers, the scribes, they're all there wanting to stone him. That's, that's the agenda from, from day one. 
Then you have the Jews that are trying to like, do we believe this guy or not? I mean, this is a Nazarene, right? That's what the Jews are thinking. This this guy was born in Nazareth. That's like the, the, the hood. That's like, I mean, you don't actually listen to someone born in Nazareth, for heaven's sakes. So you got that kind of mentality. And then you got the Gentiles who are hearing something for the first time because the Gentiles are considered scum and dogs and dirt and beneath the Jews who are running the show. And the Gentiles have never heard anything about anything. They've never been to a temple. There's no such thing as the word of God. There's no such thing as God as far as they know. And so that's, that's his audience. And Jesus is realizing that he is trying to address so many different cultures and mindsets and prejudices. And so, so we have to keep that in mind as we're, as we're going through this. And so everybody is like, what everybody has seen is that no one has ever been able to cast out as quickly as, you know, ever, not, I don't want to say as quickly, but ever, not only cast down a devil, but a man who could not speak all of a sudden is speaking. So that is a prophecy by Isaiah, which I'll, I'll talk about. Isaiah prophesied that. And these people that are watching, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the lawyers, they know this is an Isaiah prophecy being fulfilled. And that's when, so so that's what in the background, what, what you, you the, the common reader doesn't know unless they know all 300 prophecies that the first coming of Jesus fulfilled, it's, it's easy to overlook. And so that's why we have to understand how much these people wanted to divide the house and started taking Satan's side. It was easy to do. And I just want us to see how easy it was to do that. And so, and so again, in, in Luke eleven fourteen, 14, um, it said the dumb spake. So the man that was possessed for probably his entire, as far as anybody who's ever seen this man, has never spoken. And all of a sudden, this man, who is probably outside, basically, of the gates of any city, uh, is now speaking. So if you understand the culture of the day, everybody would have passed by this guy. Everyone knew who this guy was. And, and it says, and the people wondered. And, and by saying people, the Gentiles, the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, everyone knew it because this, this man would have been poor, and he would have been sitting at the gates, as all of them did with leprosy or who had devils in them. For whatever reason, they were lame in whatever way, and they were begging for mercy, for money, for anything to live. These people depended on the other people to just get by on, in daily life. It's not like they, were, they weren't, you know, while there were some possessed people, as we read in other accounts of Jesus casting out demons in the cemetery, hiding in the forest, that sort of thing. That's not this guy. This guy is dwelling by the gates, like some others will be, um, as you read all of the, and we're not reading all, we're just reading Luke 11 here. So Jesus is, is ministering, and um, everybody at this point is wondering, is he the promised Messiah? And you hear about that because Matthew records it in Matthew 12, 23. Again, you have to understand the difference between Matthew and Mark and Luke, so sometimes we need to compare the same story because we're going to get a different angle. We're going to get a little bit of a different version. It's not, it's different in a way of just, you know, how all of us have our own ways of seeing and hearing things. And, and, and so Matthew is picking up verbatim, right? What people are saying about this. So that, that Matthew records that anyway. And so, so other people, right? Mostly, especially people around Nazareth. Uh, they're wanting to see more miracles before they make up their mind on, on who Jesus is. We'll read that later in Luke 11, verse 16. Now here, the scribes that are, are there, this is Galilee. I think I, I think I already said that, but in case I didn't, they're in Galilee, which is like 70 miles from Jerusalem. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes that are here listening to Jesus preach in Galilee, they came from Jerusalem for this. That, that, you, that you can read, again, Jesus' actions, Mark 3, 22. So they don't believe in him at all. However, we all know that they should know better because Isaiah prophesies this in Isaiah 35, verse 6. It, it says, the Messiah will cause the tongue of the mute to sing for joy. Um, now, 
There is no account in the Bible ever of a prophet or an apostle specifically causing a mute person to speak. Only Jesus does that. That's why this is so significant. No other prophet, no other apostle, no one was given that ability, that power, never for a mute person to speak. And so, um, and again, Matthew 9 records it. Matthew 15 records it. Mark 7 and Mark 9 all record the same thing. So while Matthew mentions that the man, uh, the Matthew, again, will also say that the man was blind. That's in Matthew 12, 22. That again is a fulfilling of prophecy of Isaiah 35, 5, which says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Again, no one else in the Bible other than God himself, Jesus in, in flesh, um, has done or ever will do. No one else has ever prophesied about that. So there you go. That's just, that's just a couple examples of over 300 prophecies that these people who are so hard-hearted, who Jesus says, your father is the devil, uh, that these people will continually ignore over 300 prophecies in which they saw Jesus do. So one day I can go over, if you guys want, I can do a video or a study on those 300 prophecies, but that's not for today. So moving on, Luke eleven fifteen. But some of them said, he cast out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Now the word here, again, you got to keep going back into Hebrew and into uh, Greek, into the concordance. The word, be okay, the breakdown Beelzebub, the word Beel is the same in Hebrew, or I mean, sorry, in Greek as Baal, B-A-A-L. So Baal means Lord. And so Beelzebub was originally a Philistine or Philistine god, which meant Lord of the Flies. So depending on how it's said, it's very subtle Hebrew ways or Greek ways of saying it, Beelzebul is frequently confused with Beelzebub. So there's Beelzebul, which Baal is the bull, or Beelzebub, and Beelzebub means Lord of Filth. Either way, you get, you get the you get the meaning. Lord of Flies, Lord of Filth. It's 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 a satanic god, but these people worship it. So, however, having said that, it's two distinct gods. So Beelzebul and Beelzebub are two distinct gods in, in many other times called Baal, and there's other names for that. I'm not going to get into all those other names right now. So by claiming that Jesus uses Beelzebul to exercise demon, the scribes from Jerusalem are accusing Jesus at this point, which most people don't understand, um, as they're reading it, they're, they're literally accusing Jesus of witchcraft and Satan worship. See, these people really understood idolatry and witchcraft and Satan worship. They got all this information from Moses. Right? This has all been passed down for eons of time. And so they, they're they very familiar, which most of us are. Most of us are taught to read the Bible not with any supernatural understanding and certainly not with this constant uh, I guess I would say the constant usury of witchcraft and Satan worship. It's everywhere. I mean, the old world, the culture, it's on every corner. You're buying idols on every single... You cannot escape the Greek orgies and the Greek gods and the worshiping and the witchcraft. It's, it's, it's so commonplace as if to be, the, you know, for an example, the 7-Eleven on the, on the, on the corner. Like everywhere you turn, there's a 7-Eleven selling everything needed for witchcraft, idolatry, and Satan worship. It's, it's, it's that common. That's what that world is all about. And which we, we do, that, that's been take, we've been so churched away from that out of our Bible. We just don't have that in our head as we're reading this stuff. So Jesus is pointing out the absurdity of Satan telling his own demons to leave a man when removing the demon would cause damage to Satan's own domain. 
So that's going to be spelled out as we go on and read Luke 17 to 18. And so some people, um, you know, the, it, they're the, like the people in this day or even people reading it really are wondering at this point what's, you know, it's, it's, it's confusing to the average reader. And so Satan, um, so, so what's being said is could Satan reassign his demons to fool people into thinking he's benevolent. And so this is where, um, I should say this is why, not where, but why, Peter um, says in 1 Peter 5, 8, um, that Satan is constantly looking, to, seeking to devour someone. And so I think I, I have, you guys know First Peter 5 eight. we don't need to, to read that. You know, Satan is, is like a roaring lion seeking to devour. So Luke eleven sixteen, and others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. Verse 17, but he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. Now, if we let, for me, I'm always doing an exegetical Bible study, which means we've got to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And the time uh, of the greatest ever, really, of God's house, if you go back and you look at what Jesus is, Jesus is always pointing out, he's always uh, fulfilling Scripture. And so anytime you see Jesus, or you know, we read Jesus speaking or Jesus telling us a parable, it's all, it's already been prophesied that, that he would do that. And so we, we always have to understand, okay, what is he saying here? What is he pointing out? Because he's really speaking to the church, the so-called church in his day, the so-called Pharisees, Sadducees, the lawyers. He's, he's overturning that. He's overturning the law, which is what that's considered then. Um, and so we, so, so we always have to think of, he's saying, he's proving a point He's making himself known through scripture. And so why is he saying this? Why is he talking about a house divided against himself? Well, he's referring to Solomon because the first and only real, many times a house gets divided. But the, the big one is we're talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, that's, that's God's house. So, you know, Jacob, you know, has the 12 sons. So the 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 sons of Jacob, who Jesus is going to come from, right? Jesus, you know, everyone knows that. And because that's later used in other parables and other teachings. And so that's what he's talking about is um, if we're looking at lineage, because first it's going to be from David. So it's going to be David and then, you know, or I should say, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and so on. And so what we're looking at is when were the 12 tribes separated? It was in Solomon's house. And so near Solomon's death, and again, you can read that in, in 1 Kings, and I'm not going to get into that, but you guys probably know that uh, before Solomon even dies, um, so it, Solomon has two sons, Rehoboam, um, which was to take the throne and Rehoboam was an evil, evil, evil guy, worse than Solomon. He was gonna he was gonna rule the people way worse than Solomon did, because be, people became to hate Solomon. And Rehoboam, it was already known how bad he was gonna be, and he was gonna put such a burden on the people. And then he had his brother Jeroboam, right? And there was this whole rival. And and again, you can go read that in Kings. That, that's not for today's study. But it broke up the tribes, all right? The 12 tribes became the 10 tribes and the two tribes of the northern and southern kingdom of Israel and Judah. Again, that's all in 1 Kings 12. You can read that. 1 Kings 12, you can make that in your notes and read that later. So, and, and then you would go through, there's the whole Maccabean War, and uh, the land gets divided into Galilee, Samaria, Judah, under the authority of the Roman Empire. And so this is, um, again, it's, Jesus is talking about a timeline. These people understood what he was saying. 
uh, because again, what's happening when you have that divided family, what happened there is eventually you've got the Herodians at Jesus's birth, so right? Great King Herod, great King Herod, he ruled over uh, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, Decapolis, Perea, and districts to the north. And so when he died, the territory was split. And uh, so basically now everything that was originally all kind of one house, one land, one, you know, people and nation, everything is now divided. And it's all under Roman occupation and Roman rule. And which, of course, we know Herod tried to kill Jesus by killing all of the boys born for the last two years. Anyways, so... So I'm just giving you a little background. You guys understand that background. So moving on. So so the, G, so the Jews were constantly reminded of what a divided kingdom and a divided family look like. So that's the reason I point all of that little bit of background out. So this is not the first time uh, Jesus has known the thoughts of them. In other words, Jesus is saying, as you when you read it, especially when you read it in Matthew and Mark's accounts, Jesus under he he's reading their mind. He knows what their thoughts are. And so he is saying something before the accusation comes in. Before they can accuse, Jesus is addressing this. And that's why he talks about that. And so um and, and again, it's not going to be the first time he knows the enemy's thoughts. He always knows the enemy's thoughts. And so what's happening here, he knows that both the leaders, the religious leaders that were from Jerusalem there in Galilee, that they were intentionally being uh, destructive. They were being arrogant, right? They were, they were, again, always wanting to stone him. So, and they've already made up their mind about him. They refuse to see Jesus as the Messiah. They refuse to see his... Uh, fulfillment of prophecy over and over and over. All he did was fulfill prophecy. They refused to accept it, to see it, or to acknowledge it. Um, so they have already made up their minds. So so that that's what's going on here, as I just read in Luke uh, 15 to 16 and 17. So let's move on to verse 18. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. So Jesus makes this point. Satan does not work against his own purposes. Satan's intent is to take glory from God. He does so in two ways. First, in this timeline, by convincing people, right, uh, that are, you know, um, I guess I would say Satan hates humans. Let's put it that way. Satan ha hates all people. And so what he's trying to do is to, um, to convince them, I guess I want to say, um, how, how can I best say that? So when you talk about being made in God's image, so you have Jesus is a human Right. And there is this whole, you know, getting into the whole Genesis one and Genesis two. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I've done many times before, but there, there is a snake seed line that Jesus is going to point out in John eight forty four, And with getting too far into that, Satan is trying to destroy who he knows are potters. You guys know that because you've watched my videos, potter vessels. This is, he, Satan is, is consistently going after potter's vessels. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the lawyers, and the scribes are the exact opposite. And so this is what's actually trying to be divided here. This is the work of Satan that's going on, and Jesus is addressing it. It's just that the average person, uh, other, you know, they don't know it, including the religiosity. They don't understand it either. They're just, they're just throwing accusations because they're, everybody cannot, I mean, it's Jesus. No one can understand his wisdom. And so it takes time and patience. You know, it takes reading this stuff, you know, a hundred, a thousand times to really understand, you know, all of the subtle things that he says and like every single word he's using and for all of the purposes. You know, there's a reason why 
these guys left Jerusalem and followed him down to Galilee, there's a reason why he chose to do this in Galilee. So we have to take all of that into account as we're kind of like meditating on what is what we're being told here. What's our lesson in all of this? Because it's going on 2,000 years ago. How does it pertain to today? How, how are we going to use it in our life today? It still goes back to 1 Peter 5, 8. And I'll read that here in a minute. But so if one of the devil's demons uh, control a man that was blind and mute, purposefully allowing that demon to be cast out would work against Satan's purposes. That's what Jesus is pointing out. So the Pharisees are saying, you, you know, you do this by the power of the devil. You do this by the power of Beelzebub. And Beelzebub is giving you the power to do something that no one's ever been able to do. Even though Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would do it. They won't accept him as the Messiah. And so if they, if they accept that he can do this because he is of God, then that works against their agenda, right? They've already decided he's not the Messiah, he's not of God, that he is of the devil. And they're trying to make their point. And again, you go into Matthew's account, you can read more of that in Matthew's account, but um, I'm just summarizing it for you. So when you study this particular parable, this particular you know, scene that's happening in Galilee this day that's happening in Galilee, you understand, you get the full, you know, understanding what's happening here is that Satan is, is using his people, the religious people, to accuse and slander because even Satan doesn't have that ability. Satan can't do that. Um, only God can make the blind and the mute uh, see and talk and so so that's 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 kind of the bottom line if you will Luke 11 verse 19 and 20 and if by Beelzebub cast out devils by whom do your sons cast them out therefore shall they be your judges but if I with the finger of God cast out devils no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you so this is one of the first time that Jesus is declaring I'm God. Now he does it. He does it many times. He'll do it, you know, on a feast day in the temple, uh, you know, saying this is the Lord. This is the day of the Lord's favor. I am here with you. Uh, and again, that's in Isaiah. But so right here, he is letting he's letting not only the people, if they can understand what he's saying and they don't, because most people, um, which many people don't know about about. 90 to 95 percent of the people that witnessed everything that he did all of his miracles who followed him who were among the people that ate of the loaves and the fishes those people all stopped following him by the time jesus is dead everyone hates him when i say he's dead by the time he's hanging on the cross he's on he's crucified on the cross he doesn't have any friends except his disciples uh, and not even all 12 only 11 and peter's already denied him right after he died. So you see what I'm saying? I mean, this is, this is, uh, Jesus himself is making a point. He's, he's coming towards the end of his teachings and he's saying, look, God has come upon you. Only God can do this. And the, this, these people, the religious people, right? They know that they, they know that. Um, but they, you know, they refuse it. So Jesus has given two reasons why they can't make this argument. First, if Satan ordered a servant to cast out another servant, his kingdom would fall. That account was Luke 17 to 18. Second, if the sons of the scribes and Pharisees cast out demons by the power of God, then how can Jesus do so by the power of Satan, which is what he says in Luke eleven nineteen, right? So I just read that. And if by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. So here Jesus comes to a deeper point. He's healed a man who was blind and mute. Again, Matthew 12, 22, can back that up. No one else in the Bible has ever recorded or has ever done a healing of the blind and the mute. But the prophecies, again, promise that the actual Messiah will do that, as I said, Isaiah 35, 5, and 6. So if Jesus cast out demons by God's power and provides healing, only the Messiah can do that. Only the Savior can do that. Then he is the manifestation of the kingdom of God. So if he is the manifestation of the kingdom of God, 
why don't they listen to them? Why don't the Jewish uh, religious leaders, the, the, you know, they got all of the, they got all the scrolls, right? They've been carrying around the scrolls, reading them in temple week after week after week after week. So there's simply no excuse. And that's why in John 8, 4, 4, Jesus will address them the way he addresses them. Um, if you guys want me to read that, we will. But that, that's a famous one. The, you, you guys are of the devil, your father. He's a murderer. He's a liar. He was from the beginning and so on. Famous. Everyone knows John 8, 4, 4. So here to finish up Luke 11, let's read 21, 22, explain that, and then finish off of verse 23. So Luke uh, eleven twenty one. when a strong man armed keepeth his palace his goods are in peace but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him he take from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils so here what jesus is saying the strong man is satan and we're in his own palace this, we are in the world of satan this is satan's kingdom so the strong man on us is Satan. We're in his world. This is his world, his domain, all right, for a time. Satan is in control over the entire world. That's what Luke 21, I'm sorry, Luke 11, 21 says. The one stronger is Jesus. The armor, right, is demons. The spoil are those under Satan's control and really torment. So the the religious leaders, the Pharisees and their lawyers, um, they can't imagine, right, that they belong to Satan's spoils. So, um, so here, that's when they start declaring, um, as in, in, in uh, John's account, John 8, 39, that Abraham is their father. Again, you got to move around when you when you're you're seeing a story that everybody's going to have an account of. You've got to read all of those accounts. For one study, I'm not going to go through all those accounts. It's too tedious. Um, but I'm giving you the, where you guys can further your study on that. You can go read about you know their their counter argument um, with John and John eight. So, and again, then it goes from John eight thirty nine to John eight forty four. And that's, that's where Jesus says, look, you guys, are, you guys are the devil. Your father is the devil. And so, um, so uh, let me, I lost my thing. Okay, so going here into, I'm looking, pulling up my notes here. So going back into Matthew and Mark, um, Jesus follows this parable with the accusation that the religious leaders are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So when they look on Jesus' work, um, that, what Jesus is doing, it's only possible they don't understand the term Holy Spirit, but they, they, they got, all right? So it's only possible one person, the hand of God, that's why Jesus says, I am, you know, I am the hand of God. I've got the finger of God on this. Um, it's only possible that God uh, can do this and... For them to declare, right, that it's from Satan, that is the highest blasphemy that can be done. But that is the religious leader saying that. That's, that's the point. The religious leaders are calling Jesus, you know, blasphemy um, because he is saying that he is not doing this from the power of Satan, but by the power of God. And that... They're, meaning the religious leaders, they are in great danger of spending an eternity with Satan in torment. Again, I refer you back to Matthew 12 to get more details or Mark 3, 28 to 30. So it's Matthew 12, 31 and 32 or Mark 3, 28 to 30. Now, the next verse is where I want to spend some time on because I felt it was the most important. The next verse is Luke 23, and when I talked with Lexi about doing today's Bible study, um, you know, while I was talking with Lexi in our in our own, you know, today's language, like, well, let, let, how do we, I don't even think at the time I said the house divided, it was just like, how do we deal with everyday spiritual warfare? 
you know, how, how thick does the armor need to be? It's like, it's kind of like, you know, we've all had bad weeks and like, what do we do with that? How do we continue on knowing that things only get more evil continually? There's never, there's never a good time. The days of Noah doesn't, there's no break in the days of Noah. There's no, there's no reprieve. There's no, whew, man, that was rough. Let me, let me have a timeout before the next round of evil comes. No, the days of Noah was only evil continually. There's no timeouts. There's no breaks. So a bad week, right? This, this week is a bad week. Next week will be worse. And the week after that, and the month after that, and the year after that, it's only going to get worse. And so that's where, for me, when I sat down and prayed about doing the Bible study, where do you want me to go with this? There's, you know, there's a hundred angles I can do with this. And Holy Spirit immediately said, well, just go to Luke eleven twenty three and stay on that. Just concentrate on Luke eleven twenty three. And so um, here's what Luke eleven twenty three says. And, it, and you could spend another couple of hours on this. We don't have that amount of time, but here's what it says. Jesus says, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scatters. And so what he's saying here is a prophecy. Jesus is giving a prophecy. Now that prophecy is going to come true 35 years later. When Jesus says this in Galilee, that prophecy comes true 35 years later in AD 70. The Jews will scatter as Rome destroys Jerusalem. So I, I say that only because as I started out the study, God's plan all along was for the church to scatter, to spread the reason to scatter, right? The reason to destroy Jerusalem, the reason that over a million Jews actually did die during AD 70. Oh, I think it was well over a million, million and a half. Anyway, um, it, it worked for the good. Everything, no matter, even death works for the good. And so if you, if you, you can go into the Jewish library or go into whatever history you need to go into and read about what went on with Roman Jerusalem in AD 70, it was brutal beyond, beyond any comprehension. The brutality was unbelievable. So God's plan was always that it was to scatter and spread the good news of Jesus to bring about reconciliation through the word of Jesus around the world because the Jews went all over the world. The Jews had to scatter, they had to leave. Everybody hated them like they hate them today on all the comp uh, college campuses all over this country, right? The Jews, for in order to, for self-preservation, had to go to quite literally the very ends of the earth, to every little corner, nook and cranny on the earth in order to be able even to keep their bloodline or what they would call their tribe, right? They're, they're from one of the 12 tribes. The Jews always know who their tribe is. They, they take, you know, they, they, that's, that's something that's meaningful to them. And so they, for self-preservation reasons, they had to literally go into find, find the biggest rock they could find and hide under it as, as a metaphor, as a, you know, as just uh, in other words to just survive. So for Israel, right, God long ago promised to um, gather that scattered remnant. That scat, you know, the Jews are, you know, 12 tribes, that nation of 12 tribes, they would be scattered. And God promised them way back with Zechariah in chapter 10 that he would bring them all together once again. That happened under the presidency of, of Harry Truman. Harry Truman on May 14th, 1948, 76 years ago, nearly to the day that happened, which puts us in the last fig tree generation of which we have only four years left because in Psalm, in one of the Psalms, a strong generation is only 80 years old. So a, a, an average generation is 70, a strong generation is 80. We're year 76 from the, of Israel becoming a one solid nation once again. So Jesus already addressed the concept of being with or against him, right? In the reverse, as in a prophecy being fulfilled. Now, when John mentioned 
that they saw an unknown man casting out demons in Jesus' name, Jesus told the disciples, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. That's in Luke 9, 50. So the dividing line is clear. It doesn't matter if you appear to be a leader of a right of religion, a, 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 a God worshiper, if you appear to follow Jesus in an inappropriate way. And that's where I'm going to come at. And I, I say that. I say, if you appear to follow Jesus in an inappropriate way, I'm going to tell you this is from my uh, experience of in our world today, our culture. So now we got to take Jesus' teaching in his timeline, in his culture, and his people and how they would have understood him and understood his message. Now we got to fast forward to 2,000 years, and it's like, how do people today uh, divide our house? How do people today follow Jesus in an inappropriate way? Number one, it is not through the living word verbatim, precisely, exegetically, hermeneutically, the word of God. It's through some type of eisegetical stripping of the scripture and making it fit your storytelling, propaganda, paradigm, BS, usually for profit, usually for money-making purposes. All right, that's all of social media, period, hands down. There's nothing good on social media, period, because it's idolatry. So to say you found that one person that you like on social media, no, you didn't. It's idolatry, unless they're reading the Bible, unless they're exegetically giving you a Bible sto study on social media. If it's short of an exegetical Bible study, it's idolatry and it's no good, period. Uh, and they're being paid, so most likely. Um, and so that's today's inappropriate uh, followers. All right, now you also have, now. so that that came and went, social media prophets. They've been lying now for a good eight to 10 years. So hopefully the only people following them at this point is the snake seed line people. There's nothing we can do about them. They were never written in the book of life. So who cares? No one cares. But now we got a new trend. Well, now the new trend is deliverance. Oh yeah, everybody's casting out demons because the demons nowadays are everywhere as Jesus, as the Bible tells us they will be in the days of Noah. And so now every other person, especially young women, and I'm not going to get into my, my, my Bible verses on young women. You can guys read that yourself with reading strange wives or just the word strange in general, or just the word fowlers or the, 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 the women, uh, the way that the goddess divine, what do they call that? Goddess or divine fem? That's it. Divine feminine. That, that kind of BS will rise and take over, and it has. Mother Gaia, Mother Earth, uh, what, what are they called? Spiritual war, warriors, goddess warriors? I don't know. You, you, know, you know what I'm saying. Okay. It's, it's that. And then you've got just our entertainment, our music, especially gospel music. Gospel music is the worst. If you're going to listen to music, don't, 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 don't do gospel. Unless it's, you know, How Great Thou Art or Amazing Grace. All right, stick to those two. All else, get rid of it. It's our Laodicean friends. Quite literally, it's our Laodicean friends. And as even though they're, they're our friends and they're coming to our house to help us to do this or that, it still divides the house. It is a, it is a person that can throw around the name of Jesus in a fluffy New Age way. It doesn't mean that they're not a portal for demonic influence. Now, am I going to say as far as being possessed, I'm just gonna call it familiar seducing spirits. And that's what will come out of their mouth. Familiar new age language, we all know, because we all grew up with it. It's been around since 1850. So it's in the collective consciousness, it's in the collective psyche, it's in the collective, it's in, it's in all of our history books. It's, it's part of our world. We can't escape it like evolution. Darwin's ridiculous evolution. All right, it's, it's, it's ingrained. It's, it's coursing through our blood. So we got that. that. That makes it a portal of demonic influence, however you want to think of that. Or they're just downright unbelievers in anything the Bible has to say because they're so uh, academically trained in whatever their New Age philosophy, astrology, whatever their training is, they're so drunk on their own knowledge yeah, and you see them big time. They, that, that, it's not just social media. You got to pay for those guys. They got their own TV shows. 
or they're on the History Channel. History Channel is paying them, you know, to be on there for 20 seasons. You get my point. Okay, they're so drunk with what they believe is their own ancient, what do they call it? Ancient aliens? Ancient astronauts? I think that's what it is. I think it's ancient astronauts. Uh, stupidity. All right, so all of this divides our house. All of this invites demons into our house and into our children. And so um, it's, it's just that simple. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, um, you're, you're going to feel the oppression and the affliction probably a little more so. It's going to feel a little more at home. It's going to feel a little more raw. Um, however, the opposite is true of the, you know, at this point, I think the Laodiceans are, um, I think that's even been cast aside at this point. I mean, at this point, it's like, you're just going to see Satan's workers are going to be, they're going to call themselves basically workers of light or light workers. And they're going to be full of, of, um, uh, uh, just, just spread in circus nonsense. Nothing to do with the Bible. You know, that, that two minute TikTok video that I made a video on calling, and I'll, and I'll wrap it up with some Bible verses on this. Um, but that two minute TikTok video, the guy literally said, um, Jesus never said I will return, but Jesus did say the Christ consciousness will return. I, I about blew a gasket. When the guy said, Jesus says, I will not return, I, 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 did, I blew a gasket. I mean, it was like, are you, what? Are you kidding me? Do you want me? And I went through only about seven or eight verses of, on how Jesus himself said he would return, let alone the over 350 uh, prophecies on his second coming. His first coming is 300. His second coming is over 350. And this guy said that without, without blinking. That's how blasphemy is so, uh, what's the word I want? It's so, they, 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 they may as well say it from the lake of fire. I, I couldn't believe it. There is no such thing as Christ consciousness anywhere in the Bible. There is no such, there is, the word conscious is not in the Bible. Concordance is not in the, nor is consciousness. There is no such thing as Christ consciousness. And these, these, I, I don't even want to call them, they, they're way worse than Laodicean. It's, it's pure evil on steroids just just evil on steroids and so today's people right they're very aware of how often entertainment and how much their lifestyle crosses this line right there's only two sources in the bible of supernatural power period that's it there's two sources of supernatural power in the bible it is satan and his angels and it is God and his holy angels. That's it. There's, there's, the, there's team God and there's team Satan. Now, do they all have an army of, of ranks? Of, of called many things called cherubim, seraphim, uh, ophim, dominions, thrones, powers, principalities, uh, archangels, angels. Yeah, they got all those names. But this team God... And it's team Satan. That's when it comes to the supernatural. That's it. And to come with this, the stuff that they're talking about. And Lexi, I know you've encountered this in your generation of people with their intention. Even though they'll talk about a mass coming together in prayer with intention of building a better world, of building the world they want to create. The guy on the TikTok video actually said, "We can't, guys, stop reading the Bible because in the Bible it has the Book of Revelations." We don't want the book of Revelations to come true in our lifetime. And if we come together, all of us, and quit reading the Bible, then Revelation can't happen. I uh, Talk about, if I had another gasket, it blew clean the, clean the clear off of me. It was like, I, you're kidding me. This is now the fallen angel agenda that rep, the book of Revelation is not going to happen. But they believe that. And, the, and my Laodicean friend who sent it to me with a bunch of hearts lined up after the video wholeheartedly believes in that she doesn't have any idea what revelation is about but she absolutely doesn't want that to happen all right so to back up what i just said about there's only all right there is there's only there's no such thing as goddesses all right anything that you want to call a goddess or a deity like the asherah prophetesses 
um, as in the Queen of Heaven that you can read about in Jeremiah. All of that exists, their little G God. Yeah, do they exist? Yes. Are they fallen angelic gods? Yes. So that's what Psalm 82 is all about. Let me back that up and read a couple of verses and then we'll wrap it up with a prayer. A meaning the verses you can read for your divided house. I don't actually pray, I only read scripture. Uh, let's go with Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. Those are, those are uh, angelic army ranks. That's what that is. Be it evil or be it holy, they're still there. They have all of their abilities, all their power, they're supernatural beings. In verse 17, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. So anything in the spiritual world that is not of God and to his glory is from Satan and his demons who rebelled against God and they seek to destroy his work. As Isaiah tells us in 14, let's read verses 12 to 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now that's also uh, talked about in Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19. And I'm just going to say, go ahead and... Um, mark that on your notes because I've gone past an hour now. And so just mark down in your notes, Ezekiel 12, I'm sorry, 28, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19. And I'm going to skip to the bottom here. Also mark in your notes to study here about Satan. You can read that in Luke 10, 10 18. We all know that one. Uh, Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning struck down to the earth. John 8, 4, 4, I already mentioned many times. You, the father is your devil. You are of the devil. He is the, you know, the liar of liars. He is a murderer. He was from the beginning. And actually also in Jude 1, 6, we all know that one. Uh, the, the angels left their original habitation. So again, I mentioned earlier um, that God will allow certain power, right, for a time being. For a time being. They, that one day, they will be completely destroyed. But for a time being... Uh, remind us of 1 Peter 5, 8, as I said earlier, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Um, and what does Jesus say about that? He's going to destroy them. Let me remind us of Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and also you can read all 15 verses of Revelation 20 on this, the end of it, the end of it all. And so, um, again, this, I've got some verses we can stop now and we can read. Let me just give the verses on the, on the, on the, um, tape here on the, on the video, um, of what you can pray. Um, I, I never recommend praying out loud ever. But in your closet, in your heart, pray silently. Instead of using your own words, use the words God gave us. Use God's scriptures only. So when you want to pray against your house being divided, specifically uh, Matthew 12, 25. Mark 3, 24 to 25. John 17, 20 to 21. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 15. Ephesians 5, 11. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. So as you're watching this video, you can pause, you can write this all down, and you can, now, you've, now you're armed with at least, I think that's seven verses there. In Scripture, always read Scripture for your prayer. If you really want to be effective, Stick to the words of God. Don't stick to your own words. Read the scripture and the word, the ones I just gave you are the ones I picked out for myself, for myself to pray.
daily on our house being divided. All right. Amen to that, Potters. Uh, end of this video.